Hi, my name is Jim Egley, and together with my wife Vicki, we are the curriculum coordinators for New Generations. New Generations is a ministry that partners with God to launch disciple-making movements around the world. And so it's our job to develop resources for you and to help you understand the biblical principles behind the disciple-making movement and how you can uh, best absorb those and implement those in your own life, in your own ministry, in your own leadership. And what I want to talk to you about today is the seven practices of disciple-making movements. When uh, Vicki and I have been um, learning all we can about disciple making for decades. In the last five years, we've been intent on learning the principles of the disciple making movement. But when we joined the New Generations team, um, our journey really started in earnest because we were interacting with movement leaders from around the world. We were visiting um, some of them on location, going country to country, and we were looking at curriculum from around the world. What are people doing? What are the key um, underlying principles that make disciple-making movements work? And we saw the same key things in every thriving disciple-making movement. So I'm going to introduce you to those things. And I'll just be honest, we as the New Generations team are still like um, wrestling with this, what is the best way to describe these practices? And um, so in other words, um, you'll see the terminology change probably um, over the next year because right now is when we're grappling with this. Um, but the principles aren't going to change. The practices aren't going to change. Um, but what we call them may change as we think about what um, action verbs best capture these. Um, so these seven practices, and I'm going to give you um, the key term and a couple of key scriptures for each of these. You should have a handout. If you're watching this, you should have a handout. You should have been sent a PDF or you can download one. Um, you can print it out or look at it on your screen. Um, that may help you follow along. So the first of these practices is looking. Looking at the world with Jesus' eyes. Unless we see the world like Jesus sees it, unless we see people as Jesus sees them, we will not have his heart for them and we will not uh, move towards them with his compassion and his power. And the second dimension of this is we need to look um, for the team that God is calling us to work with. If you look at Jesus' ministry in Mark chapter 1, um, he, he, his ministry launches in Mark 1.14, but immediately in verse 16, he only waits two verses to start gathering a team, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. So if Jesus needed a team to fulfill God's call on his life, you and I uh, need a team even more. So those are the two things you look at. The key scripture for look is Matthew 9, 35 to 38, where Jesus looks at the crowds, he has compassion on them. And then he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. So it's like seeing the world like Jesus sees it. Not seeing the world uh, negatively, not seeing the world with anger, but seeing the world with Jesus' compassion. The people are lost. And the response to that is for us to bring the kingdom and mobilize prayer and mobilize workers for the harvest. The second practice is prayer itself. And we have a couple of key scriptures for that. Um, Luke 10, 38 to 42, because we need to go deeper personally in prayer 
And then also another key scripture is from Acts 4 verses 23 to 30 because then this is especially where North Americans struggle. Um, we need to get creative and prayer, walks, fasts, corporate fasting. We need to join together to pray for our communities. We will not reach our communities if we don't love them and we won't love them if we don't pray for them. So once we're praying, then we engage with the community. And there's different dimensions of this. One part of this is just living out loud spiritually, not hiding um, our relationship with God, but speaking of his goodness and uh, praying for people in need and then compassionately serving people. So there's several scriptures there in your handout. Uh, Mark 4, 21 to 23, we're not going to hide the light that we have. And Luke 10, 30 to 37, we're going to actively serve the people that God uh, puts in front of us in our lives. We're not going to bypass them in our religious busyness. Then the next um, practice is connecting with persons of peace. This is a key practice. And um, last year, Vicki and I traveled from country to country just to learn. That was our assignment, just to learn. And we would ask people. Some of these people were movement leaders. Some of them were uh, brand new discovery group leaders. Some of them were coaches and trainers. And we would say, tell us how disciple making movements work. And almost always they would say, you have to understand movements begin with persons of peace. So there are people all around us that God is drawing and we need to look for those people. There is no one way to look for those people. Uh, we pray and we um, just put our antenna up. Who is hungry for God? And um, the reality is though, all around us, God is drawing people. And it's not, we're not trying to reach everybody. We're trying to reach the people that God is drawing and the people that are connected to them. Now, we can be the persons of peace ourselves if we have networks of unbelieving friends. But a lot of times, those of us, especially those of us in leadership, don't have those um, networks of unbelieving friends. It's a lot of work to build one of those networks, but we don't have to if we find persons of peace. And then once we find persons of peace, we gather them to uh, learn and obey the word of God. And central in this, and the scripture for this, is Matthew 28, 16 through 20, and also Acts 2, 36 to 47. But uh, the Matthew 28 one is just simply Jesus said, make disciples, teaching them to obey. This is at the heart of the disciple making movement is teaching disciples to obey. Um, now we have a 13 lesson curriculum that goes through these seven practices, but we actually don't teach people discovery groups or discovery Bible study in our introductory curriculum until lesson 10 because uh, discovery groups this method of studying the Bible with focus on obedience and sharing what we're learning, it's central to the movement, but it's, it is not the movement. It is just one of seven practices. Do you get that? Um, and just by itself, you know, it's like if you take a car, well, if you just have the engine to the car, but you don't have the body, and the wheels and the transmission, uh, the engine might be very powerful, but it's not going to get you anywhere, is it? Um, and it's the same way with Discovery Bible Study. In itself, it's very powerful when done properly, but it needs to be combined with prayer and finding persons of peace and mentoring and so on. Um, so that's what's um, what we do, we gather people to obey the word of God 
And then as groups multiply and new leaders emerge and new groups form, uh, we gather those people, uh, those, that growing number of disciples into larger gatherings. You could call those churches. The people may be enfolded into existing churches, but at times we're going to be open to God and we're going to say, oh, wow, these people are really different than the people in the church that I'm a part of or different than the people in the church that I lead. These people are addicts or these people come from a different part of town or a different socioeconomic background or they speak a different language. So we're going to be open to like God is making disciples. He is bringing them to himself. Um, what is the best way to shape the body of Christ? Simply looking at the word of God. And that's where the Acts passage comes in. The sixth practice is mentoring because as new group leaders emerge and new groups form, our job becomes mentoring. We're not doing the work. We're mentoring people. The disciple making movement is not training driven. It is driven by coaching and mentoring. And that's a challenge for some of us because we, we weren't coached and mentored. We went to school or we went to some trainings. Um, but it's not hard to learn. It's not complicated. It, it's very relational, though. It takes more time up front, but it has far greater impact down the road. And the key scriptures for that are from the book of Acts, and they look at the life of Barnabas. If you look at Barnabas, he um, impacted people like Paul and John Mark, and they mentored people like Timothy and Luke and so on. And um, so Barnabas, he's kind of a minor character in the New Testament, but without him, we would not have the Gospel of Luke, the Pauline epistles. We would not have Luke Acts. Um, so the vast majority of the New Testament came to us because of the mentoring that Barnabas did and the mentoring that those that he mentored did. Um, so there's power in that, and that's the next thing in our disciple-making cycle. And finally, the last practice is multiplying, and the key scripture there is Matthew 13, 31 to 33, where Jesus says, what's the kingdom of God like? It's like yeast. It's like a little mustard seed. It's just made to grow. It's made to get bigger, but it starts very small. And that's how disciple-making movements work. We actually have to be very patient. This is not, um, uh, it's Jesus' method. Jesus just invested lots of time, energy, um, sacrifice into a small group of people. And over time, that multiplied, right, to thousands and tens of thousands and millions and billions of people. That's how the kingdom multiplies. But in that phase, we're releasing people to ministry. Um, so those are the seven practices. Look, pray, engage, connect, gather to obey, mentor, multiply. Which one of those do you feel like, oh, this is, this is maybe one I'm doing better at? You know, this is one I've been learning, I've been practicing. What's one that you would say, oh, I, this I've been enjoying practicing this one, and I feel like I've learned a lot. And then secondly, which one do you feel God speaking to you about, inviting you to something deeper? And how specifically can you do that? What I want you to do is take one or two of the scriptures related to that practice that you feel God is calling you to practice more deeply and do a three-column study of that meaning you write that scripture out word for word in one column, then you write it in your own words, kind of a paraphrase, not an amplified version, but a paraphrase in the second column. And in the third column, you write down how are you in the days ahead going to specifically implement that. And then who are you going to share that story with? It could be the name of a person or the name of a group. 
So again, these are biblical practices. We're just um, the disciple making movement. It's not like a project. It's implementing biblical practices so that we're learning to follow Jesus and making disciples who make disciples.